Good afternoon, Metro Community Church. We're live here in downtown Anglewood, New Jersey. I'm giving you that, mm, that extra. My name's Anthony Capola, the guest host today. Yes, that's that guy. So uh, real quick before we get into it and introduce everybody, which I'm sure many of you know who everyone on the panel is, and you probably know who I am, but just to give you a quick rundown, uh, my name is Anthony Coppola. Yes, I'm Italian, not from Staten Island, from Jersey. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> um, I am a father, a husband. I am a business owner. I own an entertainment company. I am uh, a comedian and uh, entertainer at heart. That's my, uh, my core of what I do. Former elected official, uh, former teacher, and uh, before I went into my business full time, I am probably, I would say, one of the oldest uh, not in years like 90 years old, but I'm one of the oldest Metro members. Uh, I believe I've been here since uh, before day one. Maybe Pastor Shirley has me by maybe a, a year or two, but when I factor in that I grew up with Pastor Peter, I think I hold the ace card. Got you, Shirley. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, Metro, I call Metro home. We have a great uh, church, uh, an amazing staff and volunteers. Um, so that's you know what I'm about here. Um, I'm proud to say I'm in an interracial marriage. I speak fluent Italian, Spanish, and basic Korean that will blow your mind. So, kansamida uh, ne So, all my Korean people out there. Um, what else should you know about me? That uh, So what I'm going to be doing today is, um, I thought when I was asked to come on, on board today, I thought it was a unique uh, opportunity to have someone who's a lay person, not a pastor, uh, be up here, even though I do attend Metro, uh, and I'm on Team Jesus, but uh, someone who can maybe give a different outlook uh, that maybe uh, sometimes the pastors don't see, as great as the pastors are. Uh, so my goal today is to take us into some deep water, Test that chin uh, in a respectful way, of course, and uh, go through some of the topics that uh, are, are on the in TV and media today that are uh, burning questions and, and whatnot. So we're going to get into that. Um, other than that, that's about it, uh, you know, about who I am, Sagittarius, uh, negative A blood type, if you need to know that. And um, so we're going to get right into it. Uh, Let's introduce, again, many of you know, but let's introduce our pastoral staff. Coming in at, weighing in at 100 and, no, it's Pastor Hosang to my right, your left if you're watching there. Pastor Peter Ahn and Pastor Sunate Ponton right here. And I, again, am Anthony Capola, your host. So let's get right into it. First question. Uh, you know, this past Sunday I was at church and I heard Pastor Clay uh, and he gave an excellent sermon, uh, uh, an excellent service. Uh, one of the things he talked about that, to be quite honest, as, as a fellow Christian, kind of burned me a little bit uh, and slightly aggravated me was uh, uh, he talked about uh, when people say, you know, God is great, God is great, you know, God is great. And you see it on social media a lot. You know, I got my, my least Mercedes, God is great. I bought a new home, God is great. I got married, God is great. I got my new shoes, God is great. God is great. Funny, you know, and I say to myself, God is great when everything goes your way. What about when your mom gets diagnosed with cancer? Is God great? What about when that relationship falls apart? Is God great? Pastor Clay touched upon that, that some of the trials and tribulations he's having. So, you know, like the story of Job, you know, and uh, so, yeah, uh, I'll start the question with, you know, Pastor Ho saying, is, is God great when, when it hits the fan? Well, it depends on what you mean by great, then. Tony the Tiger is great. Right. Um, but when we think of God as great, probably if we're thinking that God is the Almighty, um, that would be truer. But perhaps people have used the word God is good. And the, the whole issue is that God is good in character. God is great in character. And um, that is despite what's happening to us. So I think that Job, for example, in, in the Bible, um, he could declare that God is good. And at the end, when God reveals himself, he could say that God is great. So God's greatness is not dependent on what he delivers for us, but God's greatness is dependent on who he is personally and how he acts, because his acts are always great and all his best and all his good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pastor Sinead, what, what say you? Um, so I would agree, um, and I and um, and I'm speaking from that that um, very scenario that you 
spoke of. Um, so my mother was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease when I was in high school and she ultimately passed away from it. And I wrestled with God about that because you go to church every week and they're declaring God is good, God is great, and it doesn't feel great in that moment. Um, but you rely upon the character of God. And that's the, that's the part that doesn't change. You know, you think about so many scriptures in the Bible that talk about, I will bless the Lord at all times, right? His praise shall continually be in my, my mouth. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And the emphasis is always placed on the rejoicing, but um, we need to focus on the always part. Mm-hmm. And so it reminds us that regardless of the situation or the circumstance, God's goodness is still there. And God has, in my in my, um, in my experience, God's greatness has been demonstrated that even in those situations that don't feel good to me, God has proven himself faithful, mm. right? So he's, he's inserted himself in ways that have proved his goodness and his greatness, even when I didn't even want to uh, kind of get on board with the God is good right. train. Okay. Right. Good point, Pastor Peter. <clears throat> well, I think the greatest event in human history has been the resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? We believe that. And because of that, we, we, can, we can say that God's great, but that resurrection didn't happen unless there was a death. And I think greatness doesn't come, or we don't experience the greatness of God. You know, I agree with, with what both David and Sunita said, but I think the greatness comes as we're willing, as, as we have to embrace some of the death-like situations in life. And so when we go through, we live in a very broken world, when we go through hardships where, you know, we lose somebody we love, diagnosed with cancer, I think the the good news that we as Christians have is that God is willing to go that deep with us and through it as as we are trying to stay faithful and he's faithful to us, we'll see the greatness, the redemptive hope and what can come out of it. So it's not easy, it's not easy to embrace difficulty and hardships in our life, but what is the beautiful thing of that is something amazing can come about it and, and you'll see God's hand and his love and his acceptance through it all. So I think that's really the greatness of it. I don't think we can experience God's greatness when just good things happen to us. Right. That's just, you know, God is just, you know, we just have some things and we like to say, well, God's great, God's great. God's really great when you can go through a real hard thing in life and you can still say that he is because you see the goodness of who he is. That's, in my opinion, the greatness of who God is, that he can take things like that in our lives and that he can do something redemptive through it all. So I think that's kind of how I would answer that. Right. Yeah, and you know, real quick if I can, I mean, my own mother showed me that through, um, she was diagnosed with breast cancer and then her battle through that, uh, this woman, I surely, and she's a very religious, very devout, uh, you know, Catholic Christian, and 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 it just puzzled me. She demonstrated for me uh, firsthand when I used to take her to treatments how she was never once questioned, never once had. Fo- she just was rock solid, praising God through all her her, her treatments, and she e- exhibited what. I will, you know, what I should be, you know, what I should do. And six months after that, got a brain tumor. Still kept just nonstop, just, you know, again, like like Job, just praising God. And, and she really was uh, instrumental to, she showed me what it is to be a, a, a Christian, a faith in the darkest moments when I was pumping my fist at Christ, you know, she was praising him. And so, yeah. uh, you know, big shout out to my mom. I mean, you know, kudos to you. And, uh, you know, but it, it's difficult. Uh, you know, real quick too, I just want to invite everyone that's watching us live, uh, text your questions in, uh, don't be shy, bring it. Uh, I want to hear, I want to see it. So, um, I would just say one yeah. thing if I can say about that. Like, you know, like with, even with my kids, I think it would be hard for me to he- <clears throat> hear from them that they would say that, you know, mom or dad, you're great because you buy me a, uh, you know, a video game right. or you buy me this or you buy me that. And I think in many ways, Christians today have associated God's greatness with things like that. Right. But I think if I hear from them and say, dad, you're great because you stayed up all night to take care of me when I was sick, that you were there for me. Uh, during my most difficult of times. That's why you're great. And I think that's the beauty of the greatness of God. It's that not what we get or what we can get when we ask for a prayer request, but it's really about him being there with us, present, connecting with us in our most difficult of times and that he's there and bearing his solidarity with us. That is what makes him great in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, I'm going to move on to uh, question number two. Uh, We have a question submitted. It says, what do you think is God's perspective on the souls of millions, I would say billions, before the arrival of Jesus 
and the age of missionaries. So would there be a way for them to have reconciliation uh, with him? Um, so I'll uh, start off with you, uh, Pastor Sunil. What would you say to people who, and I've had this discussion before, and kind of another one that irks David me David might is, even have an outline here. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> he's, got some, he's got some post-it notes. Uh, you you, you want to go at it, Pastor Hosang? All right. So I'll just segue if you don't mind. So uh, we'll get you next round. The, uh, so, yeah, I mean, how do you hold someone responsible that was in the Americas before the 1400s who doesn't know? I mean, how do you write that person a ticket when they don't even know the law? I mean, is that fair? Uh, does Christ have an exemption for them? I mean, um, Pastor Hosea? Well, you know, that's a great age-old question that we have. And um, behind that question is actually the presumption that salvation is only through Jesus. Um, because if salvation were to someone else, then we would be asking that question. Um, and again, just to diffuse it emotionally, it's not we Christians arrogantly um, and exclusively saying Jesus is, on, is the only way for salvation, but Jesus made this very politically incorrect statement when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And the early church followed that up when Peter and John stand before the Sanhedrin and they declare that salvation occurs only um, through Christ alone. So that's the kind of basic um, belief that we have. I think one of the ways to approach it is to recognize, going back to the character of God, is that God is just and God is merciful. Um, I go back to the time when um, God threatens to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham is negotiating with God in terms of, okay, how about 50 people? Of course, he goes on to 10. But in the midst of the negotiations, Abraham asks the rhetorical question, will not the just judge of the earth do right? And so, essentially, God is the one who makes decisions. Right. Now, regarding people before Jesus, I would say um, Hebrews 11 and other places uh, remind us that people in the Old Testament who were people who are God's people um, receive salvation through faith. And I believe that even though we don't have any evidence of the so-called um, uh, holy heathen, uh, noble heathen, uh, that provision was also there. But I would say that overall our job is not to be judge of this question. Our job is not to be speculator, but our job is to be a proclaimer of the, of the good news. Our job is also to declare what we find in the Bible without necessarily have to draw dogmatic conclusions if scripture doesn't seem to be definitive on it. Right, so we're going on our faith that Christ is, that God is all fair, all righteous, that we believe and we have faith that he will, we're gonna leave that to him. He will That's do the right. Above, right, it's above our pay grade, essentially, right. right. Yeah, okay. Um, Pastor Peter, Pastor I mean, Sneed, anybody want to? I mean, uh, yeah. yeah. Otherwise, I, I mean, I would go to the next question. But yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, think I, I think he answered it perfectly. Okay. Like you know, there's no need for us to kind of wonder. We're not a judge, right? And we're not going to judge people whether they go to heaven or hell when they die. It's God's job, and I don't. I think it's hard for us to just determine, you know, and and, and answer that in that way. I think it's better for us to just be proclaimers of the good news. Yeah, so okay. I agree with that. <clears throat> I'm going to move on to uh, question number three. This is a, a really uh, important, uh, pressing issue that's going on right now in, in our country, and that is uh, the, um, the 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 rape uh, situations and the um, uh, sexual predators that are um, being brought to justice, and rightfully so after so long of being hidden and uh, not talked about, uh, the Me Too movement. So um, there was an actor, uh, many of you probably know, a famous comedian and has a show, his name is Aziz Ansari, was recently accused of sexual assault. Um, so while Aziz believed his actions to be completely consensual, the woman did not. So there seems to be a, a real disconnect between uh, what men and women, uh, what men and women's experience of sex are and what consent is between uh, the male species and the female uh, species. Um, how does the church break its silence on this topic of sex and teach men and women 
to relate in healthy ways, um, or, or should we? Is it the church's spot to do that, is, or is that something that's left to the homes and the schools? And beyond the uh, uh, Ansari story, and think of a broader the Me Too movement. How can the church affect change, uh, dismantle uh, the patriarchy and power women to and teach men uh, to be allies of women? So, in essence, yeah, what's the church's role? Um, in this, if any, um, it, it definitely is something that is um, pervase uh, not only in our country but across the world. But we're taking this here with the Hollywood situation and you know people in positions of power uh, doing these uh, evil things to other human beings, particularly women. Um, so, what is the church's role? Uh, do you feel, Pastor Peter? Uh, man, there's a, there's a lot. You know, I first, I think it'd be great if we could hear from Sunita first yeah, sure. as a woman, yep. and I think you have the greatest, yep. you know, um, uh, voice on this before I even share my thoughts, but yeah. Sure. So, um, it's absolutely the church's role to talk about it. Yeah. Um, I think one of the, the <sighs> silence has always been the the church's um, sort of biggest sin in my book right. um, on a lot of issues, yep. but particularly as it relates to sex, I think we tell our young people just don't do it, and then we stop, and that's the end of the conversation. Um, and we know that doesn't work because kids are having sex, because adults are having sex, mm -hmm. and they're having these relationships where they don't know how to relate to one another, and the only time they they learn, if ever, to relate to one another is once they've gotten through all the mess and decided they want to get married. And then right. they go to marriage counseling. Um, but those tools that are taught in marriage counseling really need to be taught beforehand. Right. How to communicate with one another, how to seek um, healthy relationships with people who know how to communicate, um, how, to, um, how to date. Right. Because what I think what Aziz Ansari's, Ansari's um, situation proves to us is that, or just highlights, because a lot of people know it, I mean, it's happening on, on college campuses all the time, that these, these encounters really happen between people um, in close proximity with one another, right. where there's at least a level of trust. Right. There was enough trust for her to enter this, woman's, this man's home. Right. Right, whatever that may be. Um, and so a lot of times these are happening in situations where people really know each other and they think that there's a level of trust that's been established. They think there's a level of communication that's been established and there really hasn't been. And the church has not taught women or men how to speak um, maturely about sex, how to speak maturely about relationships, and also how to set up boundaries about what's appropriate in a relationship. And, and, and I think in some ways it, you know, we cringe because young people say, oh, well, that's old fashioned or that's unrealistic, but we're not giving them any tools to work with. Well, let me ask you though, so I agree, but what does that look like though? So is that something that you as a pastor or the pastors preach at the pulpit down to the crowd? Is that something that's broken into small groups? Is that uh, seminars? Is, I mean, how does that actually look on the ground? I mean, because it's, I agree with everything you're saying, I mean, but so how do we, facilitate that? I mean, how, how does that actually look? Like, what would Metro or any church, or, or, or how does that come to fruition? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> you know, so, all of those. Yeah. You know, I think it happens in youth group. I think it happens from the pulpit when you're talking about relationships between, you know, Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. And, you know, I mean, there, there are ways that you can lift up um, biblical relationships and talk about what's happening and the power right. dynamics within relationships and use that as teaching moments. I think when you're talking to high school kids in singles ministry, um, because we tell singles don't have sex outside of marriage, and we give them no tools right. um, to work with. Put our head in the sand, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I think, to piggyback on that, I think the other um, underlying problem with this is that, and this is something the church really doesn't want to talk about, is uh, we have a problem in this country with pornography. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a lot of what young people learn what sex is mm -hmm. through watching pornography. When I say pornography, I'm not talking about necessarily the pornography, but even just watching public television, a lot of the, the, the scenes that are, you know, uh, romantic or whatever, it's, you know, that's kind of, uh, you know, in another year, another decade in the, in the past, that would be looked at as pornography. So this is kind of to your point, we're leaving it up to just people 
it's just you're on your own hey don't have it goodbye but um, I think that they're both coupled uh, again the church not speaking about it parents not speaking about it and, and so it's left to what to, to watch on your, your phone children are watching teenagers are watching young people are watching you said we're not giving them the tools we're letting it up to the dark forces to, to teach people how to be uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think I think um, the part of it is that the reason why this has become such a it's a defeating thing is that um, our kids are learning sex not from the home, not from the church, but from what they're watching. Right. Yep. And and I think the, really the call for the church original uh, what we got to do is that we have to train and we have to teach our parents to to talk about the topic of sex to their children. They have the greatest influence yeah. in this. To not make it a weird thing, like the dads need to sit down with their daughters and talk to them about sex. Yeah. I know how uncomfortable that might be, but that's an important aspect because if our kids don't hear sex first from their parents, they're gonna get it from the world. Oh, yeah. And as a result of it, that's gonna shape their understanding of what it is. And of course, they're gonna do whatever the world kind of tells them to do. And so I think it really starts from there. The church has failed to really equip parents, to train them and to really encourage them that they have to be the ones to teach their children about sex, how beautiful it is and what, what it's all about. And it's not just about don't do it before marriage, but why, why, why is that? And what's the beauty of sex? And, and why should it be, why should we wait till we get married? I think if our kids can have that understanding Understanding at the age of seven or eight years old, that prepares them. They, there's a foundation that they have now that they can bring that into as they enter into the world and as they kind of enter into the sex crazed world for them to sort of stand their ground and learn and have an understanding of it. If we don't do that, I, if, we don't, if we don't help our families deal with this, I just don't think it's. I don't think. I don't, I don't think the, the church is going to be effective in whatever it does because I think our kids get uh, has the potential to hear this from their parents and has the greatest opportunity to impact their lives so that when they get older that they can engage with this in the midst of their friends and what they're going through and the culture in which they live in. And, you know, I think it's one of the best ways to do it. So I think the church has to talk about sex more than just don't do it before marriage. Right. But why is it? Why is sex so beautiful? What's it all about? And just really having a better understanding that sex in marriage is a spiritual practice. It's no longer a recreational activity. Sex outside of marriage, I think, is more of a recreational activity. But in a marriage, it not only... It it, it 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 forms you and it helps you to grow deeper in your relationship with God as you would pray to God, right. and that's what's the disconnect. We've lost the sacredness of what that is and what sex can be. And, and let me uh, you know, push back a little bit. I mean, you know, we're talking about sex and as it is intercourse, but there's a lot that can go on that's not sex. And, and touching on what happened to Aziz is also permission. Uh, and I and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but not only does no me no, but how to read cues that are that are physical that also mean no where a woman or a man but particularly it's the woman that they're saying no without saying no and again right going back to parents uh teaching their son or daughter what to look for what no means no what does it look like because sometimes someone's not going to say no but their social their their Mm -hmm. physical cues mean no and again it doesn't have to be necessarily intercourse it could be a lot of other stuff below that too and I know this is a big, big topic that can be a show to itself, but I know I, I got a teenager at home and we had that conversation. No means no, but also when no means no, how to read no when it's not actually being said also. So, um, yeah, and, and like, you, like you said, Pastor, yeah. it's, it comes from the families, but I think the church has a, an obligation that, to your point to facilitate this. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, you shouldn't have sex outside of marriage. And so if you're in a relationship with your wife or a husband, it's a very different scenario. But even in a marriage, um, rape happens oh, all yeah, the time yeah, yeah. where the spouse doesn't want to do it. And yet the, the, the other spouse... Yeah. Uh, uses their power to over, you know, to do that, and so that's that's that happens as well. So, it really is, you know, sex is this character shaping act, and I would say for those who really struggle with this, where you know, where they just don't care what other people think, it really defines what kind of character you have. And I think the reality is sex has become a very selfish kind of a practice. It it feeds our own self-centeredness, what we want. But I think really when you look at it in a biblical perspective, sex is a character-shaping act where it's about how do I serve the person 
more than the person serving me? What can I do? I think those are even like little cues of, well, if the person doesn't even want to be served, why would I even engage in this? Mm. You know, and stuff. But a lot of times when we think about sex, we just think, okay, well, I need to have sex, they have my orgasm and move on. Right. It's so much more than that. And I think that's the thing that we have really neglected. And I think the person who asked this question is also just talking about how can men be more allies with women? Right. Um, and that's really a, another, a whole different kind of question. And it's, it's, it's really, acts, it gets to the heart of this. And I think part of it is that, you know, we have to, men have to do a better job of listening, surrounding themselves with women who can speak to them. Um, I think it's important for men to have uh, people in their lives that are mentors that are women not just men, right. um, so that women can help shape them in their leadership and how they grow. And then I think another thing is that the church has to be really good at sharing power with women, that women have to have power in the church so that we can learn and grow and, and, and lead together, that it can't be a male-dominated thing. That's a very tragic reality of a lot of churches today where it's right. all male-dominated um, and stuff. And so we have to allow women to have power uh, in the community as well. So well, that's I mean, the, the larger issue, Ben, Behind this question is not just dealing with the, the sexual area, but I think we unfortunately live in a world in which there's not only white privilege, but there's also male privilege. Right. Yeah. So we live in a context of, of male privilege. And you know, I think that um, it all starts at home. Right. So I would say that one practical way of addressing it is to ask your spouse or your significant other or other woman in terms of so what's your perspective on my perspective and treatment of women? All right, communication. Because right. that could be very revealing. Mm. But also, as, as Peter mentioned, it's not just giving lip service to the equality of, of women, but I think one of the things that um, Peter has modeled is in promoting women in ministry. And right now we have five candidates up for ordination, three of them are women. Um, I think Peter makes a special effort to look out in the congregation for people who are women, either for the leadership team or uh, uh, staff or worship team or ministry team. And so, you know, we, we need to be proactive to equalize the situation where we live in a context of male privilege. Mm. Yeah. Good point, Pastor. Uh, thank you. The, um, I I'm going to segue to question number four. Uh, and by the way, keep those questions coming. Text us. We're on Facebook Live. Bring it, baby. The um, question four, and this is actually someone uh, has you in the crosshairs, uh, Pastor Peter. Mm. This one's for you. So, uh, Pastor Peter, you preached a few weeks ago about loving the misfits uh, that we are called to accept, in large letters, accept the misfits and not just tolerate them. While you have said in the past that Metro is a church for the misfits, I personally feel we are not really a church for the misfits, uh, but a comfortable suburban, primarily Asian, middle to upper middle class plus church. Do you, so, um, well, I'm going to leave it at that. Mm -hmm. What do you say? I think the question, and it says, do you believe that Metro is a church for the misfits? Right. If yes, why? If no, why? Right. I think, I think uh, there's, a, there's a real big misconception in people believing that, you know, um, suburban, wealthy, educated people aren't misfits. Right. They are. In fact, I believe that some of the biggest misfits out there because they often feel yeah. like they have nobody they can connect with and connect with. I think a good definition of a misfit is somebody who's been marginalized but have been so isolated that they're not able to live in community. Right. And I think that's a big thing. And, and, and when you think of a misfit that is not able to be connected into community, that can be anyone. Right. And so I think for us, the popular ones are always thinking about people with disabilities, right. mental illnesses, different things like that. And I get it. Uh, uh, criminal records and things like that. Absolutely. They're definitely they're They're misfits. But I also believe there are misfits out there, very wealthy people as well, that are misfits because they live in isolation and they don't know how to sort of connect with society. And there are, there are wealthy people that often have very social disorders where they don't know how to connect with people on a social level. So because of that, they're misfits in and of itself. Just because they're wealthy, it doesn't mean that they can just connect and have intimacy and live in community. So I will say we still have a long way to go. Um, uh, if ex-cons came 
came to our church, a lot of them, uh, if different people uh, with disabilities, you know, we started a special needs ministry, which was very important for us, not just to welcome those who are uh, who have special needs, uh, but really to educate our people. How can we invite and embrace people? with special needs into our community. Right. How can we grow from that? So it's not just let's just welcome them in, but it's how can we grow and learn and realize that these can be our future leaders in our church as well. And so that's really key. And so it's kind of a both and kind of a thing. But I do believe we are. I think our leadership is very open and keen to this and that we're very uh, excited about potentially continuing to be a church for the misfits where people from all walks of life can come and they can come and they can find a home at Metro. So are we doing it perfectly? No. And I will say this. I will say that what I've my experience at Metro has simply been that I think we as adults we're okay with welcoming the misfits but if those misfits hurt our children per se the youth group we'll leave and uh, and I think we're okay with embracing it and whatever collateral damage we think it might cause but I think our parents may not be as open yeah. uh, if it's going to hurt their kids because we're very protective of our children and we don't want anything bad to happen to them. And I think the challenge for parents in our church is if we're really going to be about this and we're going to reach our city of Englewood and we have folks coming from all walks of life, um, are we open to allowing our children that we've sort of sheltered and protected to connect and integrate with other kids who come from a, uh, a different kinds of backgrounds and that can cause you know other different types of conflicts are we open to to, to doing that and i hope that we can yeah. as a church thank you pastor and, and you know I, I always say this and you hit on it uh i in my experience some of the most uh some of the poorest people some of the people yeah. that are the most hurt drive Porsches and have yes, big homes. Right. I know them personally yes. and they are hurting. They're, 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 they're rotting from within yes. and they're not going to get that help because they look like they got it all together and man, they don't. Uh, but again, uh, and you know, look, I'm a member of Metro. I don't work for Metro I and I respect this person's opinion that they don't feel that Metro is not really a, a church for the misfits. Uh, I, I don't see it that way. Um, I see Metro is, uh, is, is, of course, we're not perfect, but um, yeah, I, I think we do. Uh, we're doing a good job. We can do a better job, of course, but uh, I, I think we, we, we reach out, uh, at least that's my experience. But um, so, I don't know, um, Pastor Sandy, what, what do you, what's your take on that? Yeah, I do think it's a, it's a growing. So I, I, I have lots of thoughts. Um, first, I think misfits can be self-defining, and, but it, it's incumbent upon us to search for those people who the world would deem misfits. So I think... Metro has done a very good job of self-defining itself as a church of misfits. Um, sort of, um, and Pastor Peter has talked about this numerous times about really um, coming together around our brokenness, right? And I think that's what, you know, when I think of the, the definition of a misfit, I'm thinking of a person who really understands um, that they're outside of God's grace and they need God, right? right? That right. We're, we're full of sick people, right. right? And it's our job to now look out at the world and say, who else is sick? Who else is on the margin? Who else is being hurt? And, and how can we bring those people in? And I think that, um, that Metro is doing a good job, but Metro has a lot of work to do, as right. all churches do. Right. Um, that it's a really about putting our faith to the fire and saying, do we really believe that God can stretch our hearts to love everyone, to be in community with everyone, to risk your way not being the only way, right. to risk um, your understanding of the world being changed by other people. That's a scary place to be. You know, it's a scary yeah, place to be. It's absolutely. really uncomfortable. Yeah. And I think for those of us who are sort of outside of the norm of Metro, um, we, underst we understand what that means in a, in a sense, right? Um, so I come into Metro um, as a black woman, right? Um, not as wealthy as some of the other people. And so I know what it feels like to be embraced by this community. I also know it might be slightly different if I had a tattoo on my face. Mm -hmm. Oh, of course. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean. Um, yeah. And so we have to, you know, we have to wrestle with yeah. that. You know, what difference does it make? Um, y even the people who are brought in are very similar to who's already here. You know, and I name that, right? I'm educated, I'm well-spoken, I, I, I can fit into Metro, but can someone who's never been to college, who, you know, maybe works, you know, at the grocery store or 
um, I don't know, you know, fit any other descriptor in there, are they as... They'll be welcomed as welcome easily. As easily, you know, don't look as well, don't, you know, present as well. Um, <clears throat> and, and I'm not, and it's not, um, a ding against Metro at all because oh, I think yeah. every church has to ask the same question. Right. Anytime someone looks different, acts differently, mm-hmm. um, the same questions are posed. Yeah. But I think Metro is in a unique position to really um, stretch itself because the foundation is there that we're all broken, right. that we all are misfits in some way, that there's all something that God needs to redeem in each one of us. And I think because that's our foundation, Metro has a really good shot of kind of stretching and growing into that. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Pastor Hosea? Well, you know, um, <laughs> the doctor. misfit has different different connotations. And um, so you could say, you know, is a misfit one who doesn't fit the church religious mold? Is a misfit in my church somebody who is not in the same socioeconomic or mm-hmm. you know, educational? Uh, but, you know, I think that there's also a difference between what what we aspire to be and what, what we actually are right now. That the main thing is how intentional are we to be open and accepting of people as our Lord and Master Jesus. So, you know, Jesus accepted people who for who they are. You know, he was even accused of being a friend of tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners. Mm. And, you know, I think he, he, he bore that uh, as a badge, badge of honor. But I think in, in Jesus' case, you know, and, and I think we need to emulate that, is that we ought to accept each other as we are, but not necessarily leave us where we are, because we're all on the broken transformation journey, and that's why we want to embrace people, even though it may be comfort, uncomfortable, even it may be difficult and painful, but if we want to reflect the life and example of Jesus, we need to be open to embracing people who are just different from us right. and who make us uncomfortable in the context of the church. Okay. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, going to go on to question five. And don't forget, please, uh, text us, shoot us your questions on Facebook Live. Don't be shy. Question five, you know, uh, this, is, uh, this is a hot-button issue, boy. Um, this one is about abortion. Uh, and the question from... Uh, Someone says, how does the church feel about getting abortion, specifically as a means of birth control, accidental pregnancy? Does the church consider <clears throat> the morning after pill as a form of abortion? And, you know, uh, I don't know about anybody else, but I, I've had friends that have had abortions. Um, I think, in my opinion, we demonize women uh, for having an abortion. You know, they're our sisters, our aunts, our neighbors, our, you know, people in our family, people that we know or we don't know that they have done this, but we need to uh, have empathy towards them. I, I think sometimes I see the media, and you know, I was born and raised Catholic, and uh, you know, uh, oftentimes, yeah, these women are, are demonized, uh, and they're and you the know, church you, has made them a misfit, right? Yeah. And again, these are whether you like it or not, you'd be surprised. There are sisters and our cousins and our. Our friends, they might not tell you that this has happened, but um, you know nobody wants an abortion. I think we could all agree upon that. Uh, and I think you know I try to come from that aspect. You know, no one is, you know, <laughs> hey, what are you doing this weekend? I'm just going to get pregnant, and get an abortion. Nobody wants that. And I think if we, if we can come at that uh, and understand that these are our sisters in Christ and, and and our neighbors and our friends and our family, that changes the whole paradigm and dynamic of how we tackle this issue versus saying you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad. You know, it's unless you know someone in your family uh, or friend that has done had to have do this very difficult decision you know uh, pay, listen more than you talk I would say but um, well I mean it, it's on abortion and you know it's typically a, a you know it's a, a woman's soul uh, and lonely issue oftentimes and uh, there's you know one woman on our, our panel here so I'll, I'll revert to you pastor um, w- w- what are your ideas it's a, it's a loaded quite a, a lot on, on this here but um, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, um, so, you know, speaking as a newcomer to Metro, um, I would, but I think I'm, I, I can fully say that the church feels that um, abortion should not be used as a means of birth control. Right. Um, but I don't think that means that we shame women. Right, yeah. And I think oftentimes, I think as, as, as you express, that women are sometimes put in positions where they feel like this is their only choice. Right. And, it's because um, 
we haven't done enough to place ourselves around women um, and men in different situations, but women for this particular situation um, where they feel um, that they have the support that they need. Yeah. You know, one of the things that always um, troubles me is that, you know, we, and I am, I am absolutely pro-life, um, but I also understand that we as a church haven't done what we can to help women who may not be able to have a child um, in, that, in that particular season of their life. Right. For whatever reason. And if, unless the church makes a commitment to come around women and say, you know what, we don't want you to make this decision. And because we don't want you to make this decision, we're going to do everything that we can to help support you right. Um, right. to not have to make this decision. Right. Um, but even if you do, we're still going to be there and support you. Right. And we're still going to love on you. And we're right. still going to refuse to shame you because that shame is what distances women from God. Right. And it 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 forces them to to um to put this barrier between themselves and God and even between themselves and the church yeah. um, and now we're not able to minister to them we're not right. able to be there for them and no in no way am I giving a a um a blank ticket to you know to go off and 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 have an abortion but I do think we as a church have a responsibility to really wrap our arms around women to really develop those relationships with women and to protect them right. you know it's you know there are there's an abortion clinic in Inglewood and um, I can't I understand that people are are so hurt that abortions take place but the trauma that a woman must endure to go into that yeah, um, facility yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. to me I think it's, it's so harmful and that's not the message of love that's right. not Christ's message right. it's not to frighten people or to scare people or to, to demonize them it's really to come alongside them and say hey how can we help you not have to make this decision right. um, and if you do how can we still love you? Right. you know, how can we ensure that you know that you're still loved? Right. Yeah, no, you, you're, you're spot on, I think. Uh, and that ties into the whole misfit thing. We make them misfits. And, and again, and, and when I know when I found out certain friends of mine had abortions, it changed my whole outlook on it. I was like, whoa, like, wow. You know, um, yeah, they're my friends. They're people I love. And, you know, they're not, some, nah, you're bad, you're a demon. You're No, they're not. Uh, and it's, like you said, nobody... Yeah, nobody wants to have an abortion. This is a dark situation. It's it's not, not a happy day. Uh, we have to yeah, love on them. I mean, but it, it it takes a lot from us as Christians to 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 get out of our comfort zone to do that uh, and to show them. Well, that's the only real answer uh, to what you were saying. But I, I agree. Just think it's, it's so hard to love people, and I think the church doesn't know how to love people well, and they would rather stand against a certain issue. Right. And um, you know, loving somebody who wants to get an abortion is really the the call of what Christ would want for us. Right. And, um, but, you know, Christianity today in many ways, and, and, and it's hard, especially evangelical Christianity or evangelicalism, is such a negative word, which I still love the term evangelical, but it's always associated with, oh, do you stand against abortion? Uh, do you stand against homosexuality? And certain things like that. And so it's always standing against that. Why are we, or why are we Christians wanting to be so known for what we stand against? Why right. can't we be known for what we stand for? And right. that's for people and to love them and to care for them. And that's what Jesus would call us to do. And there are a lot of Christian women devout Christian women who have chosen to live in secrecy and not share uh, an abortion that they've had because of the shame that they're going to feel because of the rejection and all of those things. And as a result of that, it's, it's causing them to have a, a distant relationship with God because they can't be fully honest with it. And and and, and I don't necessarily blame the, the, the women who've gone through this. It's the church that hasn't been able to create an environment of safety where, the, where people feel safe to just share their brokenness with one another. And why why can't we be a place where we can share that, receive, and and uh, and and experience love and care for one another? But it's just so hard. It, it just almost seems like you know the church should be the place where this happens, but it really isn't because oftentimes we come together and we find our commonality and our strengths and not our brokenness. And I, and that's the thing that I, I hope that we as a church will continue to do. That we come together. Our commonality as a church is our is our brokenness and our weaknesses and our strengths. Right. So, oh, but yeah, I believe that that most, if not all, women uh, in the church would concur that abortion means a loss of life and death, right? Uh, because there, there's a person. But 
I think the way that we have responded to it is that we have ostracized people and demonized people rather than coming alongside them to support them and to encourage them. And you know, I think that uh, divorce, like other sins, is not the unforgivable sin. And um, I have seen people in a loving environment actually um, grow and, and blossom from it in terms of God healing them from even something like guilt and, um, and move on in a very positive way. Mm. Uh, so, you know, I think that um, we need to remove that stigma that, you know, if someone has had a divorce, they're second class citizen. Uh, they're not. Right. Um, and also, too, you know, I think that uh, the church has been accused of just being negative, negative. Um, and I would also want us to be proactive and preventive and say, okay, if the church says that abortion is loss of life and th th they would not want abortion, what practical alternatives do we have right, right. when somebody gets pregnant? That's a good point, Pastor. So, you know. Yeah. What, what alternatives do we have to offer to someone tangibly and practically to not go that way? Right, okay. Yep. Good point, Pastor Osang. We should wrap up, guys. Okay, yep. Um, so uh, the wrap up, so I, I wanna thank everybody for uh, tuning in. I, I wanted to get one more question for you, Pastor Osang. You escaped my, my claws on, on <laughs> pa uh, question six. I'll get you next time, Thanks, maybe. Sir. All right. but. Um, so in wrap up, uh, I want to remind everybody if they have any questions for future shows uh, to please submit them either uh, on the comments or online here or here, wherever this thing pops up in the magical screen. Um, I want to thank everybody for having me here to be the guest host uh, uh, this time around. Thank so it was a pleasure. No, you thank you guys. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to the pastors. Thank you for everyone watching at home. And until next time, ciao.